Hi, I'm Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Co, and today I'm going to tell you why I'm backing Wonderland's War. Now, Wonderland's War is a game currently on Kickstarter by Druid City Games. The game, as of the time of the filming of this video, has roughly 15 days left on the Kickstarter. So that's 15 days left to decide whether you want in or not, possibly some more with the pledge manager. And this, ga this game is by Druid City Games, which has a history of producing some amazing quality games in terms of their production value. The gameplay reception itself is a little less obvious, and I'll get to that. It doesn't mean it's bad. I'll get to that, what I mean by that. But the production value for all of the games has been off the charts. Uh, they have produced Grim Forest, they have produced Grim Masquerade, they have produced Guardians Call, or Guardians, I think. They've produced Sorcerer City, a game I just played and have thoroughly enjoyed. And most recently, they have produced Tidal Waves, uh, Tidal Blades, sorry, Tidal Blades, which is a game that I haven't played, but looks amazing, and Tom Vassell gave a giant stamp of his seal of approval on, which he doesn't usually do for games that aren't yet out. Usually it's a little more vague. Oh, excellent mechanics without saying whether they actually liked the game. So they have a history of producing some incredible production value in their games, but the games that have come out, I can't speak for Tidal Blades, the games that have come out have been a little on the lighter side. So for instance, Grim Forest is an excellent game. It's in my collection on the shelf right behind me, but it is an excellent game to play with my daughter. It's not an excellent game to play with my gamers' friends. I would never at all play it with my gamers' friends. It's very much on the lighter side. So it's a good game. It's not a bad game at all. It's a very good game, but it's just, it's a lighter. Guardians Call, I don't believe I've played. I haven't played it at all, so I can't comment there. Grim Masquerade, same problem. Great game to play with my daughter. Not a great game to play past that. I don't know if it'll stay in my collection, but my daughter really likes it, so perhaps it will. And Sorcerer's City, while a thoroughly enjoyable game, and I would consider playing that, what I like to call Saturday afternoon gaming. It's lighter, it's not as heavy, No, not a ton of thought put into it. But it's great for Saturday afternoon gaming, uh, but it's not great for, again, a heavy game. They haven't really produced anything heavy until Tidal Blades. Tidal Blades, I believe, is the heaviest of their games to date, but it's not out yet, so I can't comment on how it's going to fit into my collection. I can say that I backed it, but even then I kind of backed it last minute. I did. I ignored the Kickstarter and then only went in on the Pledge Manager after because I was having FOMO and second thoughts. I should really put out a video on FOMO and how to manage it, although perhaps I'm not the best one to tell you how to manage it, evidently. In any case, so they have a history. Jude City Games has a history of producing incredible production quality games, but generally on the lighter side, at least on the ones that are currently available. Uh, for this, for a game like Sky, uh, uh, for a game like um, Tidal Blades and for a game like Wonderland's War, if I'm going to back a game on Kickstarter, I generally do not back lighter games on Kickstarter. Just because historically they have a harder time, not impossible, but they have a harder time seeing their money back. Usually the games that do well on Kickstarter are games that people really, really crave to have in their collection and are willing to pay a premium for. And, and Grim Masquerade, it, it has held its value to an extent, but it's certainly not a game you're making money on. Same with Sorcerer City, it's holding its value, not a game to make money on at all. So, I was very hesitant when Wonderland's War was announced, the same way I was hesitant when Tidal Blades was announced. Just because a game looks amazing and comes from a company that has great production quality, doesn't mean it's a game worth me spending my money on. If it's not a heavier game that I'm going to enjoy, that I'm going to love, I'm going to be very happy and satisfied to have in my collection. So, why am I backing Wonderland's War? Now, to begin with, I wasn't planning on. Let's start with that. There are Kickstarters that come out that I know well in advance that they're coming out and I am an insta-back, or even if I don't insta-back it, I know that I'm going to back it. When Arena of the Contest came out, I knew before the Kickstarter launched that I was going to be backing it. When, uh, what's it called, the most recent Simon Marvel United came out, I knew before it came out that I was going to back it. Now obviously things can happen that will make me change my mind, I have changed my mind in the past, but there is a different mentality when you walk in knowing that you're going to back something versus when you are convinced after the fact. Wonderland's War, I had no intention of backing whatsoever, and I was convinced after the fact. So why was I convinced? Well, let's start with the negatives. Why shouldn't you back it? So one of them I've already covered to an extent, which is they don't have a track record of producing good, heavier games. They don't have that track record. I'm, I'm hopeful that they will have that track record, but they don't have it yet. So that's the first reason for me not to back it. If it's not a game that's going to be played at game night, if it's not a game that's going to be played on a regular basis, usually it's not a game I'm going to back. So that's reason number one not to back it. Reason number two is delays. Uh, Tidal Blades has had delays. This isn't a huge problem for me, not at all, but it, it can be 
I, I'm, I'm a tend to be a bit more hesitant when the delays continue and it's less of a track record. I'll put up with it, I'll deal with it, I'd rather have a good game with delays than a bad game without delays, but it's certainly a reason not to back. Doesn't mean I won't back, but it's certainly a reason not to. And finally, and this is a big one, the Quacks of Quedlinburg style gameplay. Now, to cover that, let's go do a, before we go into that, let's do a brief review of what Wonderland's War is. Wonderland's War, to the best of my knowledge, and I might get details wrong here, I have watched a few videos, I have not extensively, extensively researched, so if I get anything wrong, forgive me, it is what it is. Wonderland's War is a game that plays out over three rounds, and it is effectively a fighting style area control game. The game's, the first round, every round has a drafting round where you get cards, and then a fighting round where you try to see who's winning in each area, and winning is loosely defined because there are things like quests, there are things like that you can get points for other stuff. There's a there's a lot of stuff you could do. I'm not going to go into it all because I don't know it all. But I know you can get points for quests. I know you can get points for winning in areas. I know you can get points for other stuff. So it's not a pure win this area to win the game. Very similar to Blood Rage, in fact. Where Blood Rage has Blood Rage has a drafting round where you get cards first, and then there's a variety of ways to get points that are not exclusively limited to you must successfully win this battle in order to get the points. So. That's the general gameplay. It plays out over three rounds. At the end of the game, you score up your points. Doing the game, you are leveling up your, your abilities, your factions, and getting more powerful and having more ways to win and do things that are unique and enable you to win the game. So, one of the things it has in the game is a Quacks of Quedlinburg style gameplay. This is something that Manvers and Meeple touched upon in the review that it's almost a cross between Rising Sun and Quacks of Quedlinburg. I didn't. I didn't love Quacks of Quedlinburg, but nor did I hate it. I thought it was a completely solid game, totally worth playing, and it's on my, like, to get back list, but it's not a game I ended up keeping, at least for now. But while Quacks of Quedlinburg works well for the genre and the style of the game that it is, I am a lot more hesitant, a lot more reluctant, about whether Quacks of Quedlinburg fits in a game like Blood Rage or Rising Sun. Quacks of Quedlinburg is a push your luck game where it's, I mean, it's deck building, but to a certain extent it's push your luck, and combining that with the incredibly tactical gameplay of an area control game like Blood Rage or Rising Sun, to me seems like a recipe for disaster. Do I really want my intense strategic decisions to be marred by what comes out of the bag at the right time? That's not something that appeals to me at all. Like, at all. This is a giant red flag. As much as I would be happy to play Quacks of Quedlinburg whenever someone pulled it out, this is a giant red flag for me on the game. It just, it is. It's it's combining a huge element of luck with an incredibly tactical game. Eclipse. Eclipse is a game that I was really excited to finally get to the table way back in the day, and when I played it, I found that it was intense strategy marred by a few dice rolls that can really mess up your game. And I don't, I don't mind dice at all. I love games with tons of dice. I'll play Rum and Bones from today to tomorrow, just rolling dice back and forth. But that's a game that the dice are a huge part of the game. They're, they're a huge integral. You're constantly rolling. You're constantly rolling. The luck will even out. Whereas Eclipse, you could have an incredibly perfectly planned maneuver ruined by one bad dice roll, which didn't fit to me. I didn't like that blend. And I'm worried that in Wonderland War, I will not like it either. That is as far as reasons why not to back it. So, why did I change my mind? What are all the reasons that combine into me deciding that I'm going to back Wonderland's War? And are these factors for you? Do you want to back Wonderland's War? Are you on the fence? And will these help you decide? So to begin with, the art. The art is by Manny Tremblay. I believe I'm saying that right. It might be Manny. I'm not sure. Manny Tremblay, but whoever was, uh, the, the, art, the artist for Dice Throne. Dice Throne is a game that I actually am just in the middle of getting rid of, but I would have gotten rid of it a long time ago if not for the incredible production quality and art. The, the, it's, it's an incredible art, well, to put it simply, and I am thrilled that this game has that art and it blends incredibly well with the theme and it certainly is a reason to back. It's a terrible reason to keep a game, just to be clear, but it's certainly a factor to back the game. Number two is the comparison to Rising Sun or Blood Rage. I didn't actually see Blood Rage mentioned, but watching the gameplay videos, to me it actually felt more Blood Rage than Rising Sun, which to me is a good thing. But it has that, that genre of multiple rounds, getting abilities in each round, and using those abilities to build up a more ever-improving force and to become a force that you reckoned with. Meanwhile, your competitors are doing the same, so it's a constant escalation within an area control game, and it's also confined to a limited number of rounds to make it not go out forever. This isn't Kemet where it can just keep going, keep going, and I love Kemet, don't get me wrong. But it has a timer on it, and it's it can feel too short at first, but it tends to work out well. That, that style of gameplay, I love. The Quacks thing has me a little scared, but this part is a huge, a huge pull for me. Absolutely a huge pull. Reason number three is the fact that there are What's it called? The um, 
there are variable player powers in the game. The, the, the variable player power is the fact that you ha each faction has its own card, its own abilities, its own way of leveling up, and I love that. In addition to the drafting, which is a huge pull for me, and it's a different style of drafting, which I really appreciate. It brings something new to the genre, new to the table. But the variable player powers and how how differently they can, they what's it called, they can work together and how you can level up your characters and your tribes. And the fact that there's different characters and different, not tribes, but factions coming out, it, it adds for a, a unique gameplay style with this incredibly variable and plus power. And if you've watched my videos enough, you know by now that I love powers. Powers are fun. Reason number five is the likelihood of me seeing my money back. This is a game that, based, I mean, I, I could be wrong about this. Keep, the, keep me wrong. Keep, keep in mind, I could be wrong about this. But it does look like a game where I'm likely to see my money back. If not, make a profit. I'm not looking to make a profit on this. I don't think it'll be selling for huge amounts of money. But there will be a retail edition. But and I mean, on these games, by the way, never go for the retail edition because I, mean, I shouldn't say never, but I won't. I never go for the retail edition because at that point I just rather get it in retail. I'm going for the full all-in premium chips, everything, because that's where I'm likely to see the someone else who wants it. Because the game is likely, based on reviews, based on everything else, the game is likely to be liked by enough people that having the full all-in edition will at some point mean I get my money back if I don't like it. Um, and if I do like it, then I have the all-in premium edition. So it's a win-win. Uh, this is a game where I don't believe. I'm taking a significant risk with my money. Possibly, maybe I'll lose a bit on shipping or not. But it's not a game where I'm wondering, oh, am I making a bad judgment call? This is a completely untested publisher and it just looks cool and it's shiny. I believe I'll send my money back, and that is a big factor when I decide to back these games, especially the games I'm on the fence about. And finally, and possibly most importantly for me, reason number six is the Man vs. Meeple review. Man vs. Meeple does a lot of Kickstarter previews. They do a lot. I enjoy watching them, they, they tell me how to play the game. But they don't as often give their opinions. They don't as often, and I don't know if the, how, how transparently they did give their opinions here, but they certainly hinted at their opinions in their full video where they had it all, all, they talked about it after. They talked about the fact that they play this game, they've been playing this game for over a year now. They talked about the multiple changes and iterations that this game has gone through, meaning it has been play tested, it has gone through this, this path of seeing what works and what doesn't work. They, Man vs. Meeple put out far more than a here's how you play this game and here's what you need to know video. They put out a real, they were clearly, to me at least, they were clearly into the game. They clearly enjoyed the game. They have a video series where they they play one round of a game. They didn't play one round, they played all three rounds and they seemed to thoroughly enjoy it and they talked about how many times they played it before and the fact that they've been playing it over the past year and watching through the whole channel and the changes that's gone through over the past year. This is a game that clearly they enjoy and are not just giving their paid Kickstarter opinion on. And that to me is a big one. There are so many people today, I mean, for instance, King of Average is someone you should subscribe to if you don't already. His videos are great because he produces his opinion. I don't always agree with his opinion, but at least I know that I'm not just being sold a, here's this game, take a look at it. When he gives a product, when he gives a video review of something, I know that it is coming from his actual opinion, and that is a big reflection on my decision to buy a game. This is more than this game has cool minis and looks fun. This is someone who is telling you whether they like a game. The other channels don't always do that. I mean, other channels, I'm sure there are other channels that do it, but some of the bigger names, uh, Rado, Dice Tower, Man vs. Meeple, they don't always give you their actual opinion, and they have to. I understand why. This is this is the, the, the market they're in. If they gave their opinion, then people wouldn't want to give them their game as often because there's a risk you won't like it, which happens to King of Average. Uh, but when they do give their opinion, it carries a lot of weight for me because I'm not worried. This goes back to my money back argument. I'm never worried about whether I'll like the game. I'm worried about whether it'll completely tank and whether I won't see my money back. As long as people like the game, then even if I'm not in that category, you will likely see your money back on these Kickstarters. The only real fear is when no one likes the game. When no one likes the game, then you're kind of, you know, up creek without a paddle that you now bought into an expensive game that actually hasn't been playtested well. And that's really where the fear is. So that's really it. At the end of the day, despite the comparison to Quacks, despite the delays, despite the, the fact that they produce lighter games, I'm all in on this one because of Manny Tremblay, because of the Rising Sun slash Blood Rage gameplay, the very well player powers. Oh, I didn't cover a reason. Sorry, I left it a reason. The unique theme. There is an inc this is an incredibly unique theme that I am super sold on. I don't have any games in my collection that are Wonderland. That's a very specific, very unique theme, and it, to me, it's a good reason to back game. I have so many political games. I have so many settler-style games. I have so many medieval games, so many space games. There are so many games in my collection that often do not have a unique theme. And so when games, and even, even the ones that have unique themes, are still 
crossing. So for instance, Too Many Bones or Cloudspire, they're both unique themes, but they kind of cross over into the fantasy genre. Gloomhaven is unique in what they bring to the table, but it's crossed over into the fantasy genre. Versus this, Wonderland's War is just, that's just insane. I'm just loving the, 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 the differences and what it brings to the table and what it brings to my collection. So there you have it. That's why I'm backing Wonderland's War. This video is brought to you by Board Game Co. Check out our site, boardgameco.com. Buy lots of games, on always on sale, always discounted. We regularly have things available for pretty cheap, and if you find something cheaper, give us a shout. We'll often adjust or match or whatnot. Often, not always. Uh, but anyways, give us go ahead, boardgameco.com. Other than that, you can like this video, you can subscribe to this video, you can watch more videos, and until next time, have a good one.